Guess what? It's time again for another edition of VoIP and Tell VUC, the VoIP Users Conference. A lot of people help us out at the VUC to produce these things, and simwood.com is one of those folks we would like to thank. Turning developers into telcos with their leading API, simwood.com. On the hosted PBX end, we've got onsip.com. Those folks, Junction Networks, have been around for a long, long time, and I've been with them for many years, personally, our company, and also the VUC PBX. Don't forget about ZipDX.com. David Frankel's also been a longtime member of the community. He contributes a lot, including the fantastic ZipDX.com conference bridge. You've heard of Oxbone.com, and they are responsible for our local rate dial-ins. So if you really must use the telephone system, go for Voxbone. Okay, except for the dig the uh, auto mute by uh, Google, uh, we did well there. I'll post produce that, put it back together. Let's uh, welcome Aaron Spiceland. Aaron, hi, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let me unstar myself. Okay, we should be okay now. Uh, and hopefully, we are coming through to ZipDX. If somebody could give me a nod on that, we should be fine. Hopefully. I don't see any nods, but there's nothing we can do if we're not. Aaron, I'm on vacation here in California, and so as a result, I don't have my normal studio, and things are a little bit rougher, but I think we can get past this rough patch, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay. Aaron, how did you get started in, uh, what was your interest in programming? Were you interested in science as a young person? Yes, and I was very interested in math as well. Um, math was my strongest subject, and so that's kind of what laid the basis for my interest in technology. And programming is logic. By the way, this is a really dumb question. Uh, the term software engineer has been around recently for a long time, but is there a difference between a programmer and a software engineer? Um, yes, I, I would say that there is, and I would say that the difference is the level of architecture involved. Sounds logical. Uh, Nowadays, if you say programmer, uh, the term uh, code monkey maybe comes to mind, something like that. It's, it's a simpler to just be a programmer. You give somebody a quick algorithm and they hear code this, right? Yes. Okay, let's talk about, um, were you interested in VoIP in particular or SIP or any of those things before you came to Digium? No, I had no idea what uh, what SIP was, and had no experience in VoIP at all. <laughs> okay, and uh, tell us a little about if you if you'd like about your background before Digium and before getting into all that. Uh, were you software engineering uh, before the five years? I'm going to assume yes, or was it a hobby? Uh, it was more of a hobby, actually. I went to college for music. I was going to be a producer. And um, that never came to fruition. Um, my, my husband got a job here in Huntsville with uh, uh, another company, not Digium. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there being no music industry here, I started looking for something else to do. And I'd always been interested in computers. Uh, Michael got me started on Linux in about 2001 or 2002. And so from there, I quickly fell into scripting and um, had a little web hosting business there for a while when you could make money and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, had open source scripts on the internet that people downloaded and used. And um, really came to Digium to do internal tools um, for, for supporting the engineering department. And uh, they liked me enough to keep me and gave me interesting things to work on. That's very cool. It's funny, yeah, Linux is like the gateway drug, isn't it? Uh, you start with scripts, you know, it's like, oh, there's all these tools, uh, so I can, uh, I can pipe, you know, do this and then send it into a pipe and then you start messing with awk or uh, other, sed is a great, sed's a great, I love sed, I have to look it up every single time I want to use it, <laughs> I have to go back to the <laughs> manual page. And there's a lot of things on Linux, but anyway, that's a great way to get going and then all of a sudden you go, well, wait a minute, I can put this all in a file, and then you find out about variables and stuff, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, so 
what's stopping me from actually using other languages. By the way, I saw Perl in your resume, or your the resume of your uh, career and so on. Yeah. Uh, I invited Randall Schwartz. He's often very busy, but Randall literally wrote the book on Perl. But let's talk about mm -hmm. the languages for for a moment here. Is is first of all, what what language are you working in? I assume C, but no, I don't do much in C at all. In. Really? Okay, I, I daily. What is your lot. daily? Uh, What's your daily tools? My daily tools right now are Perl and JavaScript. So I'm doing a, I'm doing front end and back end um, um, development right now. Okay. No Python at Digium. Lots of Python at Digium. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Just not part of my daily work. Gotcha. Now Perl is um, Perl is a pretty tough language to really master. Again, I, I've got a couple things I maintain in Perl that I did not write that were written by a pretty brilliant guy, but I struggle with it. I mean, I have to, I, even looking stuff up doesn't help me really. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your introduction to Perl. What was your introduction to Perl? I mean, was it because you were in Digium and they go, okay, this is in Perl, you're going to have to start dealing with it, or how did you um, get into that? I got into Perl back when I had the web hosting business. Um, Michael started it, and then I took it over. Um, so all of our uh, maintenance and automation scripts were written in Perl, just because it was it was it was something very powerful that I could pick up, you know, half or half or seventy five percent of the functionality pretty quickly. So we were able to write some really powerful automation tools in Perl that allowed us to grow faster than we would have been able to without automation. And this was before the the existence of so many of uh, the enormous number of modules for MIME and all, all of the various things that you can do, I would assume, if it was just several years ago. Uh, there were a good number of modules out even back then. Um, and again, we didn't do a whole lot of low-level stuff, so uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty easy to pick up quickly when you don't have to do a whole lot with it. Strictly out of curiosity, what platform was the hosting, the servers were running what? Uh, they were running Red Hat Enterprise. Okay, well that's some serious stuff right there, rather than the cheapest uh, down and dirty. I guess mm -hmm. licensing was a little bit different in those days too. Who else has some questions here? I have no lack of questions, but I'd love to hear other voices. I, I have a, a couple of questions for Aaron, being a, a software engineer myself historically. Um, so my uh, expertise is historically far more on the software engineering side than uh, what I think people are used to, loosely termed as developers these days, which is sort of a, a mix between the both. Do you use any formal uh, methods at all? Is, is there any structure to the way that uh, Digium designed these things, or is it uh, pretty much ad hoc and all internal processes? Um, are, you, are you referring to our products? I'm ref referring to the, the way that you design or develop software. I don't think it matters whether it's internal or, or external. I would, I would hope the same standards would apply to both. Um, in terms of software development, I'm not sure if we have a, 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 a method, you know, a structure of building up a, an application or a library. Um, I try to start with uh, the segmentation of the code. Um, building out a uh, framework first and then adding functionality and then you know going back and forth um, uh, molding as uh, as the particular job uh, sees fit so is it more of an evolutionary cycle than a, than a revolutionary cycle I think so yes yeah okay that's fine that's thank you that's uh, that tells me a little bit more about that did you and uh, a bit more about the way that commercial software is developed generally, to be honest. Over to you, Randy. Thank you. Is that all? Is that all you got, Andy? Not for the moment. I've got a lot more, but uh, I'll let uh, other people carry on. Okay. And before we do, I want to mention um, Aaron's uh, visit is has reminded me that I've been remiss. Astrocon. Aaron, you're probably going to Astrocon. I would guess. Yes. Uh, being as it's in Atlanta this year again, Astrocon yes. code. Astrocon code for the VUC followers, which is a pretty loosely defined group, if you're watching this or listening to it, AC VUC 13. Gee, I think, or is it AC 13 VUC? Uh-oh. Somebody look that up for me, would you please, and I'll change that. I think it's AC 13 VUC. Come on, Andy, you know that. I'm not like... So. We 
We probably met briefly, uh, Aaron. I'm pretty sure I hung out with Michael a little bit, or at least met him. You know, the thing about Astrocon is that you're in all these groups, and they're very dynamic, and they move around, uh, like when you're going in and out of sessions, or if it's uh, one of the social events, and it's frankly pretty hard to keep track of who you met and who you didn't, but pretty sure last year there was something with either one or both of you. Um, let's talk about Astrocon a little bit. Do you, are you presenting? Do you talk there? Have you, or have you spoken in the past? I have not. I would like to in the future, but maybe in the, maybe in the distant future. <laughs> okay. Not this year, I take it? No. Has Michael sp spoken, or will he be presenting? No. Okay, because, yeah, I mean, there's how many hundreds of people at Digium, so it's not like everybody gets up to the podium or there'd be no room for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Should we take a quick uh, poll here, too, while, we're, while I've interrupted everything? Uh, Peter, are you planning on uh, Astrocon? He's unmuting. Yes, I'm unmuting. Uh, yes, <laughs> in fact, in fact, I think I'm speaking there. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I, we, we, let's assume that James will probably be there, although we don't have him with us to confirm that. Um, Carlos, have you been going? You went in Phoenix, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I went to all the ones here. Uh, skipped the last couple of years. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen this year. And, and we had that discussion briefly last week, and then I forgot mm. to figure it out. Okay, well, when you get it ready, you let us <laughs> right. know. I'll ask Andy, but I'm not sure. He, he's, it's a pretty long distance for you, Andy. Well, it, uh, it more depends about position in, in this particular case. I don't think I will be. I, okay. Well, we'll follow that. Back to you, Aaron. Uh, other than Perl, any, any languages? I mean, um, daily, yeah. you know, common that you commonly use, I mean. Sure. sure. You know I mean? Um, I'm doing a lot of JavaScript right now and, and Perl with my work on the Gateway series. Um, I have done um, Python in the past. I really enjoy using Python because of how clean it is. Um, I have done some C, but I wouldn't call myself a, a C programmer. Um, I, I guess that's the extent. I, ha I have done quite a bit of Java um, on my work on our internal tools, but as far as Digium products go right now, it's for me, it's a Perl in a, in a JavaScript world. That's it. That's really interesting. I would never. Perl is like the last language I would have guessed that uh, would be used there. I don't know. It's. Uh, I guess it's come a long way. It's complicated for me. Maybe it's the last language I'd use because I understand it so poorly. I'm also horrible. While we're listing things I'm bad at, I'm also horrible in C++. But I'm. Uh, I know what I'm doing with C. I can understand it, and I can watch, look at somebody else's code, and usually figure out what they're what it's supposed to do. Perl, by the way, I even a single line of Perl. It's it's so um, it's so elegant that uh, every line contains like a whole universe of stuff it's doing. <laughs> How are There's you? There's more than one way to do everything. Yeah. How are you at commenting? <laughs> Tell us the truth now. In my code. Yeah. Uh, the most recent the most recent piece of code I've written is about five thousand lines, and I would say about half of those lines are comments. That's excellent. Well, work, when you're working in a, for a company, obviously it isn't like me where I've got, every, you know, I look at my code three months later, I'm going, what does this even do? <laughs> Plus, I give them bad names. And in a company, mm -hmm. you obviously, you guys have a, I'm sure, have conventions about naming, uh, and uh, that's generally what people do when they work together. I am pretty much work alone, and as a result, I have the, mo the worst most horrible code, totally ununderstand, not understandable even by myself. <laughs> Are there any? Now we can't hear people in uh, in uh, IRC, and I'm going to be muted when I do this. But I'm going to look at IRC and make sure that I'm not missing. And I am, and I was muted. All right, hold. Okay. So far, Tim Panton said hi. So if anybody ha does uh, say anything, one of the uh, one of you gentlemen will have to ask the uh, questions for the person. Well, Tim says he's got a question. Oh, but how is he going to answer it if he's not in the hangout? Mm. Let me PM him the. Uh... So I'll be muted again. Sorry for the pause. If anybody else has a question, please speak if you can, and I will going to invite me uh, Tim and everybody else while I'm muted by Google. 
Ah, no, his question is, is, is ZipDX working? <laughs> <laughs> or is ZipDX but, woking, actually? <laughs> it is, apparently, but uh, I just sent him a... Okay. Yeah, well, that's a no-brainer. Uh, Tim is asking you to talk about WebRTC. I don't know if that's something you work on, work on but... Um, of course, um, we're I all have, interested. I have, uh, I have played around with it on my personal time. Um, it's really interesting to me just because of how it, it marries VoIP and, and web technologies. I think we're going to see some really cool things coming out. Um, I'm very excited to see the things that people are going to be doing with WebRTC that aren't just voice and video calls and that aren't just, uh, just sending game type of data like we've heard um, use cases about, about sending game data over data channels. I'm really excited about seeing unconventional ways that people are going to use it to do things that we haven't thought of before. Yeah, it's especially exciting in that um, in the world of SIP or even X, um, you have a client and that client knows how to do one thing, whereas WebRTC obviously opens up a whole universe of things, many of which we haven't imagined yet. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I have to jump over to IRC for anything further. Who else has questions? Big silence. Aaron, what what are all of the languages used at Digim? Like, Randy, I, I didn't expect um, to hear what you were working on, actually. I guess I always assumed it was mostly uh, C and... Uh, I, I suppose Switchbox uh, you know, has a front end, but I'd never really thought about it. Yeah, um, so Asterisk is obviously written in C, and there's a, I believe there's a little C++ in there, but um, we have our internal tools. Uh, we're not written by us, but we have done some improvements and, and written some modules in Java. Um, our test suite, I, I believe it's written in Python, or at least it was in the early days. Uh, it's been a while since I've worked on that. Um, uh, Switchbox has a lot of, tools in the back end that are written in Perl. So that's why we uh, also chose Perl for some of the things on the back end in the gateways. And um, lots of JavaScript, obviously, in, in the various front ends. That's it? That's all I can think of. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, recall... Um, the early experiences with Asterisk and C and the skeleton system of learning how to code where there was a, I believe it was called skeleton, uh, kind of a stub um, application. Is that what they were called mm -hmm. back in the day? So you're working on the interface, specifically, uh, again, day to day. What are you looking at? In other words, what, what's your day? What, you know, today's Friday. Uh, maybe after lunch you're done, I don't know, but <laughs> this, what were you doing this morning or this week is just in general as far as uh, modules, things like that? Whatever you can tell us, obviously you can't tell us everything, but give us an idea a little sure. bit of the daily thing. The most recent thing is we got the, um, the, the 4 and 8 port gateways out, so we've, we've, there's been a big push to, for features and, and stability and testing, so this week I've been working on some testing, automated testing, and um, the gateway interface is a lot of JavaScript um, with a, an extend API similar to um, Switchbox's JSON, or excuse me, XML extend API. Um, so we've been doing a lot of, um, of stability testing and, and um, working on the, the JavaScript, um, the, the interface, the ad administration interface for the gateways. And obviously you're pretty good at JavaScript. How long have you been doing it? Um, I suppose I'd have to say about 10 years. So I got seen, started in my web hosting days. Again, the web hosting days. I, <laughs> that's a, kind of a surprise to me, too. Uh, JavaScript has gotten huge in importance. I don't know if you're familiar with, you probably are familiar with, all of you, of the, the Chromecast device that you can plug into an HDMI uh, input on a television. And uh, someone is working on, people are working on apps for it. 
and apparently some of these apps are built on JavaScript, maybe all of them. Um, the point being that a guy, um, and I don't have his name in front of me, has built a way to send local data from your laptop or tablet to the television, to the Chromecast device on TV. How did he do this? He built a web server in JavaScript. Does that uh, boggle your mind, Aaron, or does that seem like, oh, I could do that in a day? Um, that, that's interesting. I would like to look that up and find more about that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know I, if I could do it in a day, no. Well, I don't know that he did it in a day either, but I find that uh, surprising to say the least. I know that, you know, from my point of view, because I'm not good at JavaScript, um, that the evolution has been huge. I know that people like Tim, who was asking that question before, uh, People at Voxeo and people at Digium have recently done a lot of stuff. It, it's, it's more powerful than I would have expected. Uh, and so uh, kudos to all of you who are working in JavaScript. I certainly, it's like looking at Chinese as far as I'm concerned. Well, at least from line to line, I can generally see what it's doing. Are there other languages? Are, are there any proprietary languages? Um, Huntsville is home to Intergraph Corporation as well, big company that you, I'm sure you've heard of. And Intergraph had a whole bunch of prior, pro, proprietary languages they, they invented for their internal products. Does Digium have anything like that at all? We have Dial Plan. That's a good point. I should have thought of that immediately. So that's the extension. And that's still, is, is .ae still a thing or? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. That was a, how, how would we even explain that? Carlos, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, um, but I didn't work with it. The old, the old system was uh, the extensions, which was the dial plan, and then there was a, I already forgot how uh, that was described, but it's just another file that interpreted uh, the commands differently. Are you good at dial plan, Aaron? Tell the truth. Uh, I I can I can work around. <laughs> I can I can, I can find my way around the dial plan. I'm sure you can. I don't uh, write dial plan every day. No, and you probably shouldn't have to. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, how about personal projects? Anything you'd care to comment on? Talk about? Are you working on like um, uh, Raspberry Pi or anything like that? Or do you go out canoeing and forget about programming on your own time? You have a family too, I know. I do. I, yes, I, I prefer to spend my away from work time doing fun stuff. So we do a lot of kayaking. Though I have been working some with uh, Node.js recently. Uh, it, it came to mind when you were referencing the JavaScript web server that I was wondering if they used Node.js. Um, of course, then it would be a, uh, a native kind of application. Um, I do a lot of running and exercising, and I have two little girls that, that take up a lot of my time. That's very cool. By the way, I said canoeing. I had no idea. You know, that was just a guess. <laughs> so. Kayaking would have been a good one. We're going to be talking to Diana from Yate at the end of the month, and I know she's a huge kayak fan. Maybe Yate and uh, Asterisk should get together on, and have a kayak contest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, who else is going to help me out here? We have a chance, a pretty unique chance to talk to Erin. She's never been with us before, and if we don't have better questions than I can come up with, she probably will never come back. Well, Randy, Anybody? <laughs> yeah, Randy, you, you had started with the... Um, uh, the discussion about dial plan, um, and one of the things that's always been a real challenge, and and I wonder how you work around it, is uh, uh, how you write a front end or interface other products to what the dial plan is. The dial plan is, um, let's say, uh, it has a lot of possible permutations, a lot of possible ways to do the same thing, and how do you decide how to manipulate it? Um, well, the big thing is keeping in mind that everything has to be done programmatically. So keeping it simple is uh, a mantra. Um, uh, we, we went through this problem with the gateways. Uh, we ended up using a lot of Go subs to um, 
define functionality in segments. And from there, especially since the gateway is such a simple uh, machine when, when we're talking about dial plans, we don't have a lot of phones hooked up to gateways and a lot of endpoints. It's, it's a lot of throughput. Um, so that we were uh, very, I guess, very lucky in that regard. In that particular product, the dial plans were very easy to manipulate programmatically. Have you worked with the more complex devices, Switchbox, or any any other dial plan related uh, work, other than the gateways? Um, I, I did do a little work on the Astro GUI. Um, it wasn't a whole lot, and it wasn't in the very beginning when there was a lot of the fundamental groundwork being done. Um, but other than that, I haven't worked with a lot of uh, auto-generating of dial plan. Now, do you, uh, do you end up uh, ever driving information back then to the people who are actually creating the, the products to a change or extend the, the dial plan? Or, or the, uh, you know, the capabilities of the, the device? Mm -hmm. Well, Asterisk is so capable to begin with that we can usually find a way to do anything we want to. Have, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever needed to request a feature or additional functionality. So ever, run, ever run into those uh, undocumented features that uh, uh, might solve something? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I know I have, but I don't think I'm going to be able to recall a specific example. Oh. But I know we ran into some of those with the gateway work. Does, does Digium actually use the, the, the real-time system um, in Switchbox? Um, I believe Switchbox does use it in some manner. I'm not familiar with ex the specifics. So do, does that mean then that you don't use uh, AEL asterisk extension language or Lua scripting from within uh, asterisk itself? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. It's actually uh, a bit of a, uh, it's not really a technical one, but um, Randy's been trying to make August uh, Women's Month or Ladies Month on the VUC, and it seems that he's had quite a bit of difficulty filling up the slots. Um, technology, w women do seem to be a, a, well, there are less of them in technology than men, and in telecoms it seems to be even worse. Uh, do you think we actually have a problem here that women seem to be so underrepresented underrepresented and um, if there is a problem is there anything that you know people in technology can or should be doing about it? Um, I'm, I do think there is a problem of uh, women not not uh, getting into technology, getting into programming engineering. Um, I think some of it has to do with the fact that the, the industry is so saturated by males and, and, and it's a bit uh, intimidating thinking about going up against um, men every day in, in, in life and in, and in your career. Um, I think a lot of it though also has to do with the fact that women like to be safe. We like to do what we know and, uh, and maybe not branch out as much as uh, men have a tendency to want to go learn new things and do everything and, and, uh, and challenge themselves more than I think women do. Um, I think if we encourage women to challenge themselves and do hard things and um, um, learn new things, and, and then I think we can get women represented in technology more. Um, I think the basis, well, I think uh, one side effect of this problem, at least, is that we have a ton of smart people in tech and the more people we get in tech, the more smart people we get in tech. So I'm not really sure if uh, women in particular um, not being represented in technology or being active in technology in general um, poses much more of a problem except that we can all improve ourselves when more people learn and do hard work. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there anything you th that you think the people in technology can do to, to help or is it a, a sort of wider society education thing where actually you need to be talking to, to not really women but girls and making them uh, or, or helping them take more interest, making them try out these things when they're at school to, 
to to you know find out that they like it rather than uh, letting them drift in or is it is there something the industry can do or is it a wider problem do you think I, I do think that it would be hard to get women who are already in a career to move careers and it, it would be much easier to get girls interested in engineering and math and um, and so that they don't have to overcome a lifetime of thinking, oh, I can't do math, oh, I don't want to build a car because it's hard, or all that kind of thing. Um, I've been lucky enough never to have to deal with some of the more negative issues in the workplace um, during my career. I've heard many terrible stories about sexism and, and discrimination, and I'm very, I feel very lucky to never have had to be in a situation like that. Uh, so I don't have much experience with um, how, how that kind of environment could be improved because I've never been in that kind of environment. No, I was just wondering if there was something that can be done in industry to make uh, just things in general seem more welcoming. But as you've said, you know, somebody's not really going to change careers. So it's uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, get to them young almost in terms of if you want to bring people into a new field. <laughs> You know, Peter, I, I think um, there's there's a factor here, which is that the future is about changing jobs and ch reinventing oneself. Let's face it, a, a job goes out of date one day from one day to the next, and this affects uh, women and men because women are a big part of the workforce, even if they're not enough in tech. And uh, I wasn't going to bring all this up, but since you did, um, I think it's a worthy topic. And I'm glad that companies like Digium seem to be much more friendly, open to, you know, not worrying about that aspect of things. Also, I think that Aaron, you in particular, um, are have just the right level of confidence. You're not really uh, worried about it. And one of the reasons it's hard to find people for us to get on the VUC is that a lot of the women in tech, I. <laughs> It's one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about this is because I think that women think, well, when they get on, they're going to have to talk about how, what it's like to be a woman. I personally was interested in getting more women on, but only to talk about what it's like to be in programming or in tech. So uh, I think the problem will disappear. It'll solve itself soon because I think uh, the initiatives you're talking about, Peter, um, are coming. If you follow on Digium, on Digium, <laughs> Google+, Plus, if you follow somebody like Liz Quilty, uh, in New Zealand, she uh, posts a lot of things about uh, initiatives um, and getting to young people in general. Um, this said, and I'm going to ask a question finally <laughs> uh, to Aaron, uh, this said, I'm not that convinced that everyone on the planet should learn to code. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this initiative, but yeah, I mean, you should expose people to everything, I guess, when they're young. That's a big problem of education systems in most of our countries. But Aaron, do you really think that uh, everybody should code or learn to code? I think everybody should have experience in logic. Huh? Um, I, I think a lot of the a lot of the getting people to code may just be let's get people thinking about logic and get them. Uh, and logic goes hand in hand with math, of course. And so if you get them interested in, in logic and math, then the ones who are very interested in that topic or who are, are better at it naturally will drift into programming and into engineering. This said, when, when you were in um, school, junior high, high school, uh, were you exposed? I mean, you, you were interested in math early. Did this interest predate... Uh, your first courses in math in school as, as a young woman or uh, did it was it instilled somehow in the education system which would surprise me I think my interest was piqued by my eighth grade advanced algebra class I really loved my teacher I picked it up quickly and so I kept on taking advanced math classes through junior high and high school and then and through college too up through I want to say it was calculus C or, or differential equations or something like that was my last math course. But I enjoyed it every step of the way. I think I was always naturally inclined to be a little bit mathematical and a little bit logical. 
Uh, my husband likes to call me a Cylon or a robot because of how logical I am in everyday life. Uh, so I think I was well suited for, for math and engineering from a very young age. That's interesting. My wife is very logical too, but um, she got disinterested in science after a an explosion in a chem lab in a high school, minor explosion, and the, the teacher blamed her somehow, and that was the end of her science career. However, <laughs> Uh, there's good and bad in school. That's interesting. So you, you had an uh, inspirational teacher, and that's uh, that's excellent, but unfortunately not always possible. Uh, in my own case, I was not interested in math until I got into computing, and not because I was applying it, but because I saw, well, graphics, for example. When you're graphing, when you're trying to create um, geometrical figures, suddenly I understood what ge geometry geometry was about. Uh, before then, I didn't see any point in learning that stuff because I thought, well, the table, you know, I can measure the table and figure out its surface if I need to, but even that's rare. So uh, in my case, it was backwards. It was computing getting me interested in, in uh, actually, most geometry is about as far as I can go. I don't know anything about algebra or calculus, certainly. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on... Uh, the topic of getting interested in programming and logic, just in general even. You could start by saying how you got into all this, uh, all of you. I'll, I can start. My uh, dad brought home a second-hand computer when I was about four. <laughs> and I was never good at games, so I learned how to program it. <laughs> Excellent initiative. So that's yeah. where you go. Excellent initiative. <laughs> That's why I like the Raspberry Pi idea and things like that. You know, you you can give something like that relatively inexpensive, and it, to to a child, and if they're interested in it, then great. And if they're not, it's not like you've spent hundreds and hundreds of pounds on some equipment for them. <laughs> right. Speaking of children, Aaron, uh, you said I think you said daughters. You have two daughters, right? I do. They're and five and eight. Okay. So, um, how do you see their path? And are you guys doing anything to kind of push them on the stage of mathematics and things or exposing them to all that? They're we young are. still. Yes, um, my eight-year-old eight is in third grade now and I believe last year they did a three-digit addition and subtraction in school. But we have already taught her how to do multiplication and division and basic, uh, basic algebra, one variable algebra. So we're trying to get her interested in math at an early age too. Um, Michael did buy her a Raspberry Pi and has it set up on her desk in her room and um, he, he did try to teach her a little Python but she didn't want to listen so she prefers uh, Super Mario Brothers Wii. <laughs> okay I'm trying to uh, trying to get back to the right I was trying to read uh, IRC. Can somebody else read the question from IRC, please? Andy, can you? Are you on IRC? Yeah. Because with one eleven-inch it. screen, it's it's impossible. It's it's way down. Uh, very recent. Sorry about all the trouble of uh, following IRC, but. Uh, we're we talking about uh, Mr. Ballow's question. Yeah, he's uh, there's a couple things, and that's one of them. Yeah. Okay, he, he, he says, uh, do you have any comment on Tizen for Digiomaps on upcoming RTP optimized LTE mobile phones from Intel or anything like that? So a simple question. <laughs> um, I don't know much about the, uh, did, did they say AT&T's new LTE phones? Uh, no, he's talking about Digio Maps uh, maybe coming up for RTP optimized LTE mobile phones. Oh, I I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure. I think John's yeah, going to have that, to ask that himself. Uh, yeah, and I absolutely. Do, and he's not even on audio, so he can't do that. And I absolutely don't know what that's about. I'm sorry. All oh, right, and he also wanted to ask something. Uh, is there SNMP in the four and eight port gateways? Um, I don't. I I don't remember. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I I can find out. 
Well, I'm sure he'd like that. <laughs> That's not really a question that Aaron deals with yeah. daily. But, okay. uh, and he, he's also pointing out that Tizen is, in fact, an operating system for a phone, not um, a, a phone itself. Oh, thanks for clearing um, that up. Yeah. I had no idea what it was. Tizen, T I Z or Z, T I Z E N. Yes. Dot com? Uh, dot org. Uh, dot org. Tizen.org. For those of you listening or want to go see what that is, I will, I know, but after we're done here. See if there's any final questions. Go around. Um, anyone? I'm afraid to touch anything. I'll be muted. So you, you guys will have to tell me if anybody says anything in IRC. <laughs> Otherwise, Aaron, uh, go ahead. Aaron, are, are there uh, particularly interesting things that you're working on that you're allowed to talk about? Um, mo most of my work recently has been with the gateways and... Um, Personally, playing around with JavaScript a little bit. I mean, um, excuse me, Node.js, and um, have done a little bit of uh, playing around with the WebRTC APIs as, the, as those have become available in Chrome and Firefox. Um, I don't know if there's much new at Digium that that I can talk about. Um, the biggest thing is the the quad and. And, and octal gateways have just come out. They're shipping now. We're really excited about those. Um, they have just been, it's just been wonderful to work on them. Um, the people have been, that I've been working with have been a new group of people for me to work with and have been great. And um, we're very pleasantly surprised with the stability that we've been able to get in the gateways and very excited to see those going out and, and being put to use. And they have a, um, an API now that, um, that, that uh, became available, and I want to say it was last summer or last fall, and um, so they're so easy to configure either through the graphical administration interface or they can be configured programmatically through the API if you have a lot of them to deploy. So I'm really excited about people uh, using the API and, and seeing what people do with the, with the gateways. Now you said you're, you're working with new, uh, a new group. Uh, is this new hires to Digium or are you just uh, working with a, a different group at Digium? No, just working with existing um, Digium engineers that I don't, I haven't, historically worked with in the past because I haven't been on any hardware projects before the gateways. And you know, along that line, it's been a few months now, um, what do you, how do you think things changed as your director of development left and you've got some new people uh, leading development? Um, we, we loved uh, Kevin and we, we loved Russell and we're very sorry to see both of them go in such short order. Um, Matt Jordan is just amazing, though. He's really uh, great at, at focusing us and um, and prioritizing, and, and and has really has really shaped up Asterisk 11 and Asterisk 12 wonderfully. Yeah, Matt, Matt's really good at what he does, and I did have a chance to roundtable with him a couple of times uh, last year at Astracon. By the way, the real code, thank you, Carlos. The uh, real code is AC13VUC. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, I guess the other thing was, uh, speaking of Matt and so on, um, standing with one foot on uh, commercial software and the other on open source. And I think, Aaron, you're kind of, an, kind of I mean, more than kind of, probably an open source advocate. Uh, what you're doing now, though, isn't actually open source, right, with the, with the gateways. That's right. So do you see yourself, do you, by the way, do you uh, commit to other projects? I guess not from in the light of what you said earlier. Um, I, I, I commit to, uh, I have made a few commits to Asterisk, very few, and um, a lot to the Asterisk GUI. I don't do a whole lot outside of, of the gateways and, uh, and those. And do you see yourself as doing something else um, in the future, near or far future, as far as just in general? Um, I guess, you know, maybe we won't, you won't know until it comes along, but um, anything you want to say on that? Sure. Um, I'm really excited about the new REST interface in Asterisk 12. Um, I've been working on, um, a, a, it's kind of a proof of concept, a generator for libraries. Uh, so you put in code templates and you point it at your asterisk instance and you run it and it generates the library for uh, the 
the functionality that you have uh, exposed in, in your Asterisk Rust interface for your particular instance. And so that was made possible by um, the way that we're documenting the, the Rust interface. Um, Swagger is a really great tool, and it's for documentation, but also um, code generation. So I have this project up on GitHub. Um, it's called Asterisk underscore Rust underscore Libraries. And it currently supports uh, JavaScript, Perl, and Python. And you run it, and it, it builds a it builds a library for you that that uh, has all the right API I calls for your particular asterisk instance. It's still, like I said, still kind of proof of concept, not even not even alpha. So don't go try to use it. <laughs> but I would like to, uh, when asterisk 12 comes out, either get that into a usable form or start working on libraries for the REST interface if the code generation method doesn't turn out to be something that is sustainable. Now, does Digium consider that sort of work um, supported or, or part of your, your work, or is that just, you just do that on your own? I did that uh, as part of my job, but it's not really, it's not really a Digium product. It was more kind of an experiment, uh, a research, Sure, uh, but it sounds like they provide some leeway in using your time to do things like that. Mm -hmm. There's another question for I from IRC, from uh, Paul Bellinger. Um, are the Digium gateways Blackfin processors? I don't know what kind of processor is in it. Yeah, you have you have you guys have to realize that uh, you work on a particular part of something doesn't mean that you know which screws to take it apart, <laughs> which screws you have to remove to get the box open. You know what I mean? It's, I think we're getting out there. But, Paul, uh, nice to see you. I saw your name on IRC, and it's great to see you. And, and Jer Jer, by the way, we should have a, a big fanfare for uh, Jeremy. I'm sorry I can't do that from here, but uh, nice to see the, the old, not the new faces, but the old faces once in a while. Anybody else have a question for Aaron before we... Free, set her free to do other things in life. I'm depending. I'm counting on you, Andy. If there's an IRC, Carl Fife is apparently was not able to join the hangout. Well, I have to say, an awful lot of the questions I, I wanted to try and drill down into their software engineering side of it, but they don't do it officially. So, <laughs> it's it's what uh, most commercial companies seem to do is that uh, they they don't formalize any of the processes. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. It's something very foreign to me. So I can't ask any more questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I would I would I would say one thing on the the female in technology area. In my personal experience, every bar one, every female engineer I have ever met has been as good at as or better than their male counterpart, and I think they probably have to be because of the uh, small number of you. So. I'm, I'm absolutely certain you're very, very good, Erin. Thank you. And uh, let me address one, one thing you said earlier about the software uh, processes. Um, I'm, I may have misunderstood your question. Uh, we do use agile development in our development process. Is that, is that fit something that you were asking about? Uh, not, not really. I'm, 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 I'm more looking more about the uh, the flow from uh, initial requirements through initial design, down into how you might modularize the code and, and so on. Um, so using formal processes for that, uh, probably these days you need something like uh, UML, um, mm -hmm. which I haven't used for years. Um, more like that, and, uh, and I found that an awful lot of commercial companies don't do it because. Quite frankly, it takes an awful lot of time, and uh, mm -hmm. because of that, you, you you have long product cycles, um, and not only that, they're very expensive. Yeah, so. we try to make good decisions up front, but we do have to be flexible and and uh, and keep moving and keep keep changing. Yeah. Okay. I think it's slightly different when you once you go into a, a banking environment and so on like that, but you can understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Aaron, thanks you so much for your visit to VUC. I hope you'll come back one day if you haven't. Thank you for having me. I'd love to. It wasn't too painful. Thank you, Aaron. 
Okay, everybody, we will see you. Uh, the uh, on-air portion is going to stop now, but we'll see you hopefully next week. I believe Michael Graves has a very interesting presentation next week, but uh, right now things are in flux because I'm traveling. Uh, at the end of the month, Diana from Yate will be with us. Suddenly, Jerry, thank you, Jerry, magically appears. He was doing the bridge. Um, and also, our friend, voice gal, As uh, Allison Smith, will be with us. And I'm sure Allison will also be at Astrocon. Don't forget about Astrocon, though. I want to push that, and hopefully I'll be there to meet a few of you. Thanks again, everybody who's been a part of this.